Hello and welcome back to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits. And yeah, here we are for another week of questions. And this week we're going to be talking quite a bit about socks because I just released my most recent pattern this past Tuesday, the Curio Socks. And they also happen to be the pattern for this fall's Knit Along Challenge, which is next week. So I'll show you the socks quick. I am also wearing a pair, but I've already knit three pairs of these. So I really like these socks. There is pair number one. So these ones use Retro Saria Mondim, dyed by La Bienne May. And Spin Cycle Yarns is the contrast color here for those stripes. I really love using a color shifting yarn for the stripes just because it adds some fun interest, but solids work great too. It's a great stash buster. And I actually designed this pattern for my hand spinning experiment. So I'm gonna get into that a little bit later, but these are my hand spun um, with the contrast color here. You guys, I'm the worst. I have not got, I've woven in my ends, but I have not gone back and snipped them out. So quick little tip, when I weave in ends, I always weave them in before blocking, but I don't trim them until after blocking because while they're in the bath, that allows there to be some extra yarn. So as they shimmy into place, especially if it's something like a shawl or a sweater or even socks, you might want to throw into some sock blockers. Um, it just gives that little bit of extra yarn to pull so that you don't all of a sudden have the end popping out if you cut it too short. So I like to let them shimmy into place and then once they're completely dry, I go back and trim them, which I have not done. I don't know if I've done them in any of the three pairs I've knit. I'm just kind of curious. Oh, this one looks good. How about you? All right. So I did one pair. So I started off strong. Um, and I will be honest, I have, I have some knitwear that still has tails on the inside where no one can see it. All right, so these ones are my hand spun. Again, the main color is that Retro Saria Mondim in their natural. And then this was my third pair. And these ones are knit up. The main color, that minty color, is um, Pearls Before Wine Robusta. And then again, it was Spin Cycle Yarns Cloud Nine for my contrast color. So if you're not a yarn spinner, I really love using Spin Cycle Yarns because they have that beautiful color shifting that a lot of us hand spinners, um, that's kind of the look we're also going for when we spin from painted top or those beautiful braids of fiber you may have seen before. So let's talk a little bit about knit alongs before we get into the, today's questions. If you're not familiar with a knit along, basically all it is is when a group of knitters, it can be as few as two people, or it can be hundreds, um, decide to all knit either the same pattern or maybe a theme. So every fall I do a sweater knit, not fall, we're in fall. Every winter, end of winter, early spring, I do a sweater knit along, and you can pick any of my sweater patterns, or there's knit alongs like my one that starts next week that's very specific on the pattern we're using. So we're using the Curio sock pattern that I just showed you. Now, what's special about my fall and spring knit alongs is we do what I call a knit along challenge where we challenge ourselves to knit an item within a set amount of time. It's totally just for fun. If you do not like the pressure of trying to finish a project within four, little over four days, that's totally okay. You can knit at your own pace. But some of us like to do things and be like, ooh, can I finish this in just four days? Um, it also can be like that nice little push if you're trying to get some gift knitting done <laughs> because it gives you a deadline. Um, so anyways, we are going to kick things off next Wednesday. And then the goal is to have the socks done and a picture posted over in the forums by Monday early afternoon. And we have some great prizes from Pearl 2 in Walla Walla, Washington. They're offering up a sock yarn kit in these beautiful colors, which if you may have been trying to grab Cloud9, the colorway I used for those socks, they have been sold out. So um, one of those lucky winners, I'm not sure when they'll get their next batch of that colorway in. So a lucky winner will be able to grab one of those precious skeins along with the Robusta color skein as well. And 
that's not the colorway name. That's the yarn name. The colorway name is so fresh and so green green. And we also have a um, sink cowl kit from Madeline Tosh. And this is from this fall, I joined up with their community love fund project, which I'm gonna include a link for that below. If you've never heard about that, it's a really cool project. There are some great designs and contributors and the profits of the booklet, 100% of those profits go to supporting um, the fiber community in different ways to make it more accessible and diverse. And so you can read all about it. I'll give you that link, but it's a great little um, project. Is that the word I wanna use? I don't know. I think I might need a second cup of coffee today. <laughs> um, that's not the word I want to use, but if it comes to me, we'll circle back. And um, collection, this collaboration is going to drive me bonkers. You know, some people script these things. I kind of can see why. <laughs> um, but anyways, I will link that and also a link to Pearl 2 below. And then the third prize is the most adorable embroidery kit from Knitted Bliss Stitching. So Julie Crawford, who has some knitting patterns, she's a super talented knitter, has also gotten into the world of embroidery, which was one of my early loves. I don't know if I ever, I don't think I've talked about it on here, but I once embroidered a portrait of my now husband and I for our first Valentine's Day. That was his present. It's like this big embroidered picture of us. I'll show it sometime. Uh, but anyways, her embroidery is so beautiful and it's all knit focused. So it's sweaters or she has this one. It's so adorable. It's like a bird's eye view of somebody's lap as they're knitting. Um, so they're super cute kits and it comes with everything you need. So anyway, she is offering up a kit of your choice to one of the winners as well, but definitely go check out her shop if you're into embroidery because it's so fun. Um, and I'll link to that below as well. So what else? Did I leave out any knit along details? We host it in the forums of my Ravelry group, but there's also an option to participate on Instagram using the hashtag. So I'll put the links and all that info below. You don't have to sign up for the knit along. You just jump on in and participate and have fun and make friends. I know I've shared on here before I met one of my absolute best friends through a knit along. So they are near and dear to my heart. I think they're a great way to find community and buddies in the knitting world, especially if you don't know any in your area, um, which has often been the case for me. It's a great way to make connections and also to be supported while you're knitting a new project. So um, all this is our fourth year doing the sock knit along and everyone is so helpful they cheer each other on and it's just amazing and i love it's become a tradition for a lot of people which like makes me so happy to see these same faces coming back every year and it's just fun and again you do not have to finish your socks in the weekend but that being said these socks come with 11 sizes so they are sized from everyone through baby to adults and they're gender neutral and um, so they are it's a great gift project and you can also cast on one of the smaller sizes if you've got any small people in your life that you might want to knit for all right so i wanted to talk a little bit about the inspiration for the socks so maybe i'll do that and then we'll jump into questions so as i was trying to come up with my idea for these socks i as you all know, I really, really love my DRK Everyday Socks. Those also come with 11 sizes and are sized for the whole family. And um, so I wanted to have something that was just as enjoyable to knit that I would want to knit a lot of pairs of, which I think I've succeeded there. Um, but I was thinking about my hand spun because I really do enjoy hand spun socks. Um, and also, as I have continued on my spinning journey, which I've talked a little bit about here before, I am still consider myself a total newbie. I've just started spinning about a year and a half ago, and um, I don't really know what I'm doing. You know, like I'm learning. I know a little bit, but I still am quite new. And a lot of times I will spin up yarn, but I have no idea what it's gonna look like. Like here is a skein that I just finished up 
and I have another skein from this project. I, it was a lot of yarn that I spun up and I'm actually knitting a sweater. Let me grab it. So I'm knitting a sweater out of the first skein that I got tied up. Oops, I have a scale on the floor right there. Um, that I plied up out of all this yarn. And I posted a picture of it. And here is the sweater. It's pretty wild to kind of like. And I'm gonna flip it this way too. So this is actually my sweater I released not too long ago, um, like two weeks ago, the DRK Everyday sweater. But I'm gonna have the reverse stock in that side be the side that faces out. I should finish this. I've had it almost done for like, a couple months. Um, but anyway, so I had no idea that these would, this would look like this. I mean, this one's a little different. This is all my blues where in this project, I spun up some pinks. We're going to attempt to put some photos in here because I have photos of this stuff that I want to show you, but it's on my phone and I'm recording on my phone. But as I've said, I am very low tech. And don't know how to do any of this. So my husband's going to try. And if we can't, then this is going to be a weird empty space. We're like, hey, put a picture in here of my spinning project. The first one with hedgehog fibers, uh, pinks and blues. And so the first skein that I did was pinks and blues applied together. And then this is the second skein, which is all the blues. And the third skein, I'm doing all the pinks. And I'm basically gonna see what does that all end up looking like? So we will try to show some of those photos. Okay, hopefully I've shown you those photos. Um, so anyways, I really wanna figure out how do I know how this will knit up once I've spun it. Because even here, like look at this little ball. You wouldn't necessarily know. Well, okay, yeah, those look kind of similar. <laughs> but I wanna know better what's gonna happen. So, Curio socks. I wanted to be able to do experiments. So what I did for this one is I took one braid of fiber, ding, braid of fiber picture, and I split it in half horizontally. So I put out the entire long length of it and broke it in half. And so then I had half of each fiber. Then I decided how I was going to spin um, from there two different sections that I was gonna apply differently so that you could, well, that I could see how that would change things. So I do take, I try to take pretty good notes um, so here's my, my fall sock experiment. I used Nest Fiber, which was the April Club. I even, look at, I happened to divide them perfectly in half by weight, which never happened. So it was very exciting for me. Um, so for my first spin, it was this one and I chain plied it. So all I did was that one entire thing of fiber I just spun from end to end and I my goal was to end up with a fingering weight yarn and I knew I was going to chain ply it so I knew it was going to end up being a three ply yarn so what chain plying does for anybody who doesn't spin is it keeps the colors separated so it creates what we kind of think of as a self-striping yarn and it's really fun I really like chain plying, um, but I was like, okay, do I like that or do I want more of a fractal style, which is when you can see this barber pulling happening. So for the other half of my fiber, I did a fractal. So for my fractal, again, how I, I said, <laughs> random things in here. I said how I broke it up. So I, stripped is what they call it. So you take your thing of fiber and vertically separated it into three. I left my first one that thick, 
my second strip, I stripped in half again. So I have a single section of fiber that's the thickest. The next one, I split that in half. So I had two sections. And my third one, I split into thirds, into three sections vertically. And so the first one, I just spun that end to end. That was one ply. My second one, I spun top to bottom of the first section, top to bottom of the second section all onto one bobbin. That was my second ply. And the third, the same, just spinning end to end of each of those sections. And then I spun those together. And what happens is you'll have sections where the colors line up and sections where they barber pull. And I just wanted to see what do I like better? Or where would be an instance that I like it better? I'm also trying to get better at photographing the fiber before it's been spun, the skein, and then the finished project. So I know visually when I look at a skein, what to expect when I'm using different fiber, because there's lots of different color applications for the fiber as well. Um, so anyways, these ones are my chain plied. So you can see in here, there's distinct section. They still melt into each other like a gradient very beautifully, but you won't see any barber pulling happening. So we have my pink, which fades into my orange, which fades into my green. Now for this specific colorway, I think I do prefer the chain plying because it kept those colors really crisp and nice. Because once you get into color theory, you'll realize that mixing complementary colors, so orange and blue, purple, yellow, green, red, you get brown. So depending on what colors are already present in that fiber, they can go muddy if they are blended a certain way. So here's my fractal ply. Now I only got one of each done, so I actually am still going to um, knit up one more of each of these socks. So then I'll actually have four pairs of these socks um, because you know this isn't a ton of fabric, so you don't get through a whole lot of the skein yet. So I still wanna see more of what is to come. Um, but in the fractal, so you can see how this one's much more blended all the way through. Um, and it takes, do you see how it kind of is shifting from color to color? So that's the fractal spun. I haven't even gotten into any of the blue greens yet um, that you could see so well in the chain plied. So anyways, I know this is long. So for any of you non-spinners, I hope you still find this interesting. Maybe it will make you wanna spin too. Um, but I just wanted this wearable experiment where I could put it to good use, learn more about how I wanna spin future braids of yarn and just have more information going into it because I can spend hours, days, weeks reading about all this, but for me, I am very much the kind of learner who has to apply it myself to really have it lock into place. Um, so I will also show you the actual skein spun up because they do look quite different from a cake. So da, 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 da. here's a picture hopefully of the skeins. All right, let's get into some questions because I know that was a whole lot of chatting about just spinning yarn. So let me pull up some questions here. Question number one. I am interested in knitting plastic free socks. I am looking for blends that are durable, but still soft. Can you tell me your favorite non superwash, no nylon wool blends? So I loved this question because there are different times that we wanna use different kinds of yarns. And a lot of us are trying to reduce plastic from our life in any way that we can. And so nylon free sock yarns that I really love, as if you could not tell, um, here is actually the end, the end of my little cake here. Um, Retro Saria Mondim is my go-to for a non-superwash, no nylon sock yarn. Again, I also love it for sweaters and I think it's soft. I will say it's wooly in general, especially if you're not going to have nylon in your sock yarn, you do want a really strong yarn, which means it needs to have a lot of twist in the ply and um, a lot of twist in even the singles and the ply. And so what you're gonna find is that no matter how soft the wool was going into it, it may still feel a little coarser than say an MCN, a Merino cashmere nylon, because um, it's spun to be nice and strong and to last um, without the need of that nylon in there. So this one is my go-to 
And again, I really love their colors. I also love the ones that La Bien Aimee dyed up for them. And I also love Woolly Mammoth. So I used her yarn in my Suska socks, which was the knit along sock from two years ago. And I wish I had those over here right now, but I don't. Um, but I really liked that. Sorry, you know how I always have to like write myself notes so I don't forget to tell you something in the thing below description box. All right. Um, okay. So for those socks, again, I really love the Woolly Mammoth sock yarn and all of her yarns done super wash. And I don't think any of her yarn has nylon. And she does have a pretty good focus on creating special blends that are gonna be strong for socks. So definitely check her out. Also an idea to consider is for those socks, I held them with Ocean's yarn. It's called Halo, was the actual yarn base. And um, I'm sorry, it's Ocean by the Sea. And her mohair is so lovely. And I held it together with the non-nylon sock yarn. And that's gonna give you a lot of extra strength. Most mohair has a silk core and it's so strong. Um, so that's something to consider too, is there's ways that you can strengthen your more natural sock yarns to extend their life without the use of nylon. So silk or a mohair is a great way to do that. All right, next question. And I'm just gonna write it here so I give you a link, maybe. Okay. All right, I've been struggling with measurements. I really like this question. I'm gonna answer it to the best of my ability because it is a struggle. So I don't know how to measure the length of ongoing projects. Should it include the needles? No. Should I stretch the fabric a little bit as if it's been blacked? Eh. I've made a few pairs of socks, but most of sock patterns say knit until four or five centimeters short of desired length or something like that. And I don't seem to be able to get it right. It's really tricky. Um, I know how to measure body size and finished garment size, but fabric on the needles are a bit tricky to me. Please show me how you measure the project you are working on. So it is really tricky, especially because I don't think that there's hard and fast rules for this. I mean, it really depends. We don't know. How did that designer measure that? And um, so we're kind of left guessing a little bit. One thing I will say is knit fabric's really flexible. And so I try not to stress about it too much, but something like socks, you really do want those to fit snugly. And um, so if you give a little bit too much length, then they're gonna be baggy and that's not comfortable. If you don't give enough length, then they're gonna wear out quicker. So I totally understand this feeling. Um, this is one of the reasons why I generally do a toe up sock because I like to be able to try them on as I go. And honestly, I find that I can get a more accurate measurement going in that direction. That's just what works for me. Other people may have very different experiences, but the way that I like to do it, I don't know. Okay, good, this'll work. You can zoom up, Lilith. So, one of my favorite heels, which is not on this sock, this is an afterthought heel, but one of my favorite hero heels is actually called the Flegel heel. And I've used it, I used it in DRK Everyday socks, I've used it in a bunch of my sock patterns. But one of the ways to know that you have gotten to the correct length for that sock is by trying it on and giving it a tug. Because if you think about it, we want these socks to fit snugly on our feet. We don't want them to be baggy. So I will, as it's on the needle, pull it down and you want it to reach when you flex your foot up, you want it to reach that bend right there. So once it reaches there, that should be the time you're starting your heel. Now, every foot is also unique. So it is gonna come a little bit down to trying, like take notes. I tell myself this constantly and I'm always so happy when I've done it and I'm always so sad when I don't. <laughs> because you will make your future life so much easier if you take notes today. So take a note on how that worked for you. Okay, this time I did toe up. I pulled my cord with the fabric on it up to that crook 
And then when I took it off and laid it flat without any tension on it, this is what it measured. I mean, the more notes you take, the more information you will have for later. So, and uh, I'll go back to that. So write all those measurements down, work the remainder of that sock, see how it fits. Could it have been a little shorter or a little longer? Now you know for your second sock how to make that adjustments. I do have socks in my collection where one sock fits me a little bit better than the other because I learned something after that first go round. What I also do is once I've hit that magic fit, again, I tend to re-knit the same pair of socks because once I find one that I love and that fits really well, I love to walk, go on my walks, and I love to knit a sock while I do that. And so socks that I kind of have memorized are perfect for that. And so what I'll do is once I've hit my magic spot of how many rounds, I'll actually count the rounds it takes me from the time I finish my toe shaping to when I start my heel. And I just use a row counter, which I have shown many times on here. I'll use a little row counter so that I don't even have to pay attention while I'm walking and I just click every time I do a row. And so then I know once I've hit 52 rounds, it's time to start my heel. Um, but I don't include the needle in that measurement um, because that round or row has yet to be worked. So I kind of think of that as not worked yet, um, like finished. And I do put it's really tricky too, as far as putting any tension on that fabric, because most yarn will grow at least a little bit after blocking. Um, but so that's where it's tricky. You definitely don't, I have watched people at knit night, like really yanking on their stuff before measuring. I would not recommend doing that when I am measuring for my designs, for my instructions, I'm not yanking on it a lot. I am keeping it um, pretty soft in my tension to measure. So, you know, I'm just kind of, and then I would measure softly down. One thing you do want to make sure you're doing is as you're measuring, let's say I'm measuring my cuff down to the top of my heel here, is you do wanna make sure you're smoothing the um measuring tape <laughs> with your fabric um but you don't want to pull that fabric as you go you know just like soft like this and i usually do that laying flat not holding it up like that anyways i hope that helps a little bit but i i really do believe that the most powerful thing you can do to make it easier in the future is to take copious notes. So measure today in all the ways you can think of, write those notes down really detailed, and then in the future you'll know just what works for you. Um, and that's really what's important. Okay, so next question. I really love your everyday sock, but wonder if I could omit the rib on the bottom needle just for when I wear with them with boots. If I do this, should I do ribbing in the increases? Um, so yeah, I think you could just knit the bottom of the socks. Um, I will say I love how they fit because of the ribbing going all the way around them. Um, I think it hugs the foot really nicely. And so, um, yeah, that would, but you should just be able to do stockinette and it's up to you. You can change the increases into stockinette as well, if you would like, and then it will kind of look continuous right up into that heel. And then you could start ribbing all around or you could keep them in ribbing. That's just kind of dependent on your own aesthetic, but absolutely make them your own. Next question. I love the look of the curio pattern, but I am not a fan of toe up socks. I consider myself an intermediate sock knitter and am comfortable making modifications. Do you think the pattern could be worked top down? It 100% could be worked top down. Um, it really would just be about your comfort level making modifications. So if you're comfortable with it, it really would be pretty darn simple to flippity floppity. So you would just cast on the amount of stitches that it has. Um, once you get to the full body of the sock, that stitch number doesn't change. Um, so you would just cast on that full amount of stitches, work your cuff, knit down, um, the measurement of the ankle, and put in your after 
thought afterthought waist yarn stitches. I am struggling with my thoughts this morning. Um, and keep on going. So you're really just reverse engineering it. You would do the length of sock which I even give, so this kind of goes back to question number two again about like how long to knit it. With my sock patterns that do have so many sizes, I know a lot of people are trying to knit those as gifts. So we have to attempt to guess how best to fit um, that intended recipient's foot. So I do give examples of foot length there. So you could also just utilize that. And then with the toe, you're just gonna do decreases instead of increases. So it's super doable. And then you would Kitchener stitch the toe just like you do with the heel. So yeah, 100%, these could be knit cuff down. All right, last question. I have never knitted socks, but really want to join your upcoming sock knit along. Can you talk about the needles you use and technique? Do you magic loop? I think I've seen you show a super short needle for small loops before, but can't remember the name. Um, I've also seen those cute Addy Bendy needles. What's your favorite? So for socks, I always magic loop. I am a magic looper. Um, I find that it works well for me and I enjoy it. Uh, but there are definitely people who do not like magic loop and that's okay. The one thing about these socks is that the type of cast on I do, the Turkish cast on, I do think is easiest magic loop style. The kind of neat thing about it is if you follow my video tutorial, which is linked in the pattern, on the pattern page, or you can just find it here on my YouTube channel, um, it actually kind of teaches you how to do magic loop. So by the time you've cast on, you're already magic looping. And so the sock pattern is written so that you have a top needle and a bottom needle. Um, and that's kind of how the instructions are written. But if you wanted to use double pointed, all I recommend doing is having two double pointed for the top and two for the bottom. And you just still think about those as your bottom needle and your top needle. And then you would have your fifth one to work the sock. You can absolutely work these socks on some shorties. I would put it on the shorties after you have completed your toe increases, and then you could finish them off on there. Um, I generally only use my shorties, which I, mine are from Chow Gu, and I just use those for sleeves personally, just because I'm in a good groove with my socks. I like them on my magic loop. I've got like my three different size sock needles I generally use. I have them all in one place and it's just, I'm in my rhythm there, um, but you could definitely use those. And I've also heard good things about those flexible, they're like flexible double pointed basically. I haven't tried them. So if you try them, I'd love to hear what you think or what anybody else thinks, feel free to pop that in the comments because I have not tried them myself. It's one of the few knitting needles I haven't tried. Um, so yeah. That's, that's kind of the method. I think these are pretty good beginner socks um, because really it's just some, the little cast on is probably maybe the trickiest bit. And then you've got some increases. Um, and then the afterthought heel, I also have a little video for that and it's some decreases there. Speaking of going back to the, could I work at cuff down? You would basically do the same decreases you do for the heel. There are a couple extra stitches to keep, so that there's no gaps, no holes on the sides of the socks. But yeah, super similar because all you want to do is get down to the cast on amount is what you want to decrease down to if you do reverse engineer them. All right, last thing I'm going to say, well, this has been a sock heavy episode. So um, for any non-sock knitters, I hope we have changed your mind and you decide you want to knit socks. Because I'll tell you what, once you start wearing hand knot, hand knot, hand knot socks, hand knit socks, it's really hard to go back. I have actually, while traveling, I was in Colorado, there was an unexpected blizzard. I was driving between the two cities I was teaching in and it was so cold, I actually pulled over, got into my suitcase and changed my socks into my hand knit. Um, Cause at that time I only had a couple of pairs uh, because they're just, they're just so good. So um, I did want to say too, because again, the name for these socks is Curio because of my curiosity with my spinning experiments. And I just tend to be a curious person when it comes to knitting. So I, of course, by the time I was knitting my third pair, could not leave well enough alone. So you'll see that with the first, I 
knit these, this is stockinette stitch. By the third pair, I was just so curious as to how the reverse stockinette stripes would look. And it's a lot more blended than the strong striping of the regular stockinette. So this is the knit side, this is the pearl side, um, but I loved it. So I actually include a bonus PDF with instructions if you wanna knit the reverse stockinette one and you don't have to purl a whole bunch, it's actually, you knit them inside out. Um, so it's still, it's a really similar rhythm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it's a really similar rhythm to the other ones. But um, so yeah, I just wanted to show you have that little bonus as well. And oh, let's let's switch gears and talk about shawls. So I thought it would be fun today. We're actually gonna get a little warmer here today. It's supposed to get close to 60 where it's been hovering in the low 40s. So I am actually gonna treat myself to a nice walk outside. Um, it's been a real busy couple of weeks and I, yeah. Just gonna have, I'm going to treat myself and go for a walk. I might go pen shopping because I really love pens and notebooks. But anyways, so it's today I think I'll be able to go out with a light jacket and a shawl and be pretty comfortable. And it got me thinking about shawls and I thought it would be fun to show the first shawl I ever designed. So this is faux shawl. And I'm even thinking about reworking this pattern a little bit. So I would love to hear if y'all would be interested in a little reboot of this one. So I love, love, love the um, sweet little simple lace of the fabric. And then it has, this was like right when minis first became a thing, I think. Um, so this is Madeline Tosh and she would put out these um, like neon minis. And it was just enough for like a border. But what I would like to do is play with this pattern, maybe even in a little bit heavier of a yarn weight, because I love a heavier weight lace. I feel like it looks like you put lace under a microscope. Um, and what I wanna do, do you see how there's a little bit of curling that happens with that border? It's just because it's so shallow and um, the, yarn is thin and it needed something more substantial. So I'm kind of thinking about even extending the border and giving it a stronger edge so it doesn't curl. But I still love this shawl. Um, so again, it's called faux shawl. And one thing I love about it is how easy it is to wear. It's lightweight. So again, I just wrap it. You, you probably couldn't see that. Okay, so I do wrap it kind of that real easy triangle shawl style where I'm gonna grab um, the wingspan on each side and wrap it around. And then that's it. It's like a little, or like a big bandana. Um, so yeah, I love how this one wears. I think I wanna revisit it. What do you think? Would you be interested in a reboot of faux shawl? Let me know. Um, I think it'd be fun. And I'm just curious, like, what my process was all those years ago. I mean, the shawl's probably going on seven years old, six years old, maybe. Um, you know, so your, the way you write patterns really shifts over time. So I'm curious to go back and look at that pattern. Um, but I do love it and I hope you love it too. So thanks for spending this time with me. This is kind of a long one today. So I hope you had a warm bevy and you're knitting and thanks for spending some time with me. And I hope you're gonna join the knit along. It's really fun. Everyone cheers each other on. Uh, that's my favorite part. I just love seeing how um, it reminds me. So I really love the Great British Baking Show as many do. I used to be a baker and it just, it just fills that place for me. But what I love about it is that it's all these competitors, but man, when one of them needs help, they just all flock in and help and they really cheer each other on. And it just like makes me have hope <laughs> for humanity. Um, and so I feel that way about knit alongs too. I watch people come in and offer help and guidance and they cheer each other on and I see friendships happen. I love when the conversations even steer to the more personal, what everyone's like doing in their daily life. And um, yeah, it's just, it's very special. So anyways, I would love to see you over there in the forums. It's super fun. 
and otherwise I hope to see you back here next week. Have a great weekend. I hope you get some making or some creative time during your weekend, maybe a nice walk outside and happy knitting. Bye.